the CIO at uh, Nest for about 14 years. Um, and prior to Nest, uh, he was at uh, different funds, uh, ranging from pension funds to hedge funds. And Mark also graduated from here, from Oxford. Uh, and he doesn't want to tell us when, but uh, he had a BA, BA from math and um, philosophy. So with that, uh, let's get started. A um, couple of other things. I think this is being recorded and it'll be broadcast over YouTube. Um, and uh, I would say, you know, obviously, uh, if you don't mind saving your questions towards the end, all the substantive questions. But uh, if you have any clarifying questions, please do ask them as Mark goes along, especially if you don't understand terms that he's using. Sometimes that happens. So with that, over to you, Mark. Yeah, thank you, Anthony. And welcome, everyone. I'm not familiar with this building. I occasionally went to the King's Arms uh, back in the day. Um, uh, but yes, yeah, so, yeah, so I, I studied here a long time ago. I was saying before I came in, this is the only uh, city in the world that makes me feel old because I just remember what I was, it was like when I was a teenager. Um, so uh, Ben invited me here today to uh, just talk about what it is like to invest sustainably in a, in a real pension fund, in a, in a real asset owner. And... Um, I imagine you've all got a variety of backgrounds and interests, uh, but after doing your MSc, you may well be interested in going into finance and into uh, investment. And um, it's a good career choice because at the moment, there is a massive shortage of people who know very much about sustainable investments and you'll earn a very high salary. So uh, do keep that in mind and you can always give us a call. Um, so who, who, who is Nest? Uh, you may not have heard of it. We are the 30 billion pound company that no one's heard of. Um, so we manage uh, pension funds for defined contribution pension funds for uh, over 11 million people in the UK. They are typically, we, our target market is uh, pretty low to middle income. So our largest client is McDonald's, but the guys and, and girls who work in the burger joints, they're, they're members of Nest. And uh, we have a lot of small companies. So, so, so basically, we are managing money for people who have never saved in a, in a pension before on the whole. A lot of young people. And, and the reason for us it's important to be sustainable is, you know, our youngest member is 16 years old. And we're going to be investing for her for 50, 60 years. And the world... And the climate is going to be very different, as we all know, in 50, 60 years' time. And it's really important that not only do we build up big pension pots for our members, but there's a world that is worth retiring into. So there's, there's a really strong sense of mission at Nest that we're actually doing something good for the UK and for the world. And we're growing at £5 billion a year. So we're starting to be, we'll be one of the, we will be the largest pension fund in the UK. In a, in a few years' time, and one of the largest pension funds in the world. So we can make a difference. Um, and I'll, I'll talk today about how we're trying to make a difference in practice, um, and also at the same time, and in fact, more importantly, uh, make, make good returns for our members. So there's lots of terminology about this and lots of jargon. So we call it responsible investment. You might call it sustainable investment. But, but basically, our objective is to improve the risk-adjusted returns for our members by investing responsibly. And uh, you know, a lot of people may think, well, we're kind of just sort of do-gooders and we're going to have lower returns because we're not investing in sin stocks and, and that sort of thing. Um, actually, we believe by investing sustainably, will improve the returns over the long term. And we are a pension fund, so we're not investing for tomorrow or the day after or even next year. We're investing on a 5, 10, 15, 20-year view, or in the case of our 16-year-old, on a 50-year view. Um, and how do we do that? So in, in practice, um, basically, we try and find those opportunities which will deliver positive returns and also try and manage the, the risks climate risk, social risk, governance risk um, uh, that exist in all portfolios, and we're trying to reduce those as much as we can. 
So a lot of that is about the long-term wealth creation. Um, but there are things we can do to support uh, an improved investment environment. So better functioning markets. We, we not only talk to companies to improve uh, their sustainability, we talk to regulators, we talk to stock exchanges to try and make sure that at least, you know, the governance framework and the regulatory framework support what we're trying to do in, in terms of investment. There is no point us investing into a vacuum and the regulators and, and governments are just pointing in the opposite direction. We all, if we're going to manage particularly climate change risk, we all need to be uh, aligned. And finally, um, we try and manage reputational risk because we need to build trust. Trust is really important. It's, it's hard won and easily lost. So if we want our members to stay with us for that 50 year journey, they need to trust us with their money. So we can't be reckless, we can't be careless with it. And increasingly, um, you know, just evidence of the course that, uh, that, that most of you in, in the room are doing, maybe all of you, um, sustainability is now at the forefront of people's minds. Um, and we need therefore to, to align our investment philosophy with the need of our members to invest sustainably. Um, so this, can you see the big loser title due to that? Sorry about that. So if you, uh, what, what are the challenges of being responsible investors? So the first is definitions. So a lot of people confuse responsible, sustainable investing with ethical investing. It's not they're unrelated, but they're not the same. So an ethical investor will typically exclude a whole bunch of sectors tobacco, arms, animal testing, um, things that they don't like that, that conflict with their values. Sustainable investing is um, basically finding businesses that have got a long-term future and avoiding the businesses on the whole which don't have that future. Um, and there may well be some overlap. So tobacco would be a good example. We don't invest in tobacco companies. We think tobacco is a dying industry. It's being regulated out of existence. Uh, companies uh, are, are struggling now that they're, they're, you know, there's less and less smokers in the world, not least because tobacco companies are killing them. Um, so 5 million people die every year from smoking-related diseases. So you need 5 million new customers, and you're now competing with vaping companies. So uh, that's an industry with a very poor financial outlook. An ethical investor would just exclude it on the basis of tobacco companies are evil, which is a fair comment, but we, we exclude it because we don't like the financial future of those companies. Uh, there's a lot of jargon around, um, uh, but there's also uh, a lot of data uh, and also a, lot, a big lack of data. So during your course, you're, you know, but there's a lot of reporting now on uh, climate change data, there's TCFD, um, uh, various frameworks being developed across the world to improve climate reporting. But climate, climate, and climate, the climate emergency is the biggest issue for us in terms of uh, sustainable investing. But there's a lot of other issues which, are, which I'll talk about. Getting the data, getting even good data on climate is hard enough, but getting good data on some of those other factors yeah, it is even harder. And then I get letters from our members or people purporting to be our members uh, every week saying, please don't invest in X. Uh, Sizewell C uh, nuclear power station was one. Please don't commit our capital, um, our pension fund into, into Sizewell C. So we weren't actually planning on investing in Sizewell C. But um, you can imagine that a, a group of people, uh, they send the same letter to um, to a, myself or our CEO, uh, representing their special interests. But we represent 11 million members. We need to invest for the benefit of the majority, if not all our members, not a few people who are active enough to write me a letter and say, please don't invest in X because I don't like it. So we just have to be aware um, who we're representing. We've got to, we've got to um, a legal duty to invest uh, in the benefits of our members. And then finally, it can be expensive to invest sustainably. 
So uh, when, when I talk about some of the solutions that we are uh, delivering, um, that costs money. So the cheapest way to invest is in a global index tracker um, or a UK index tracker. You can do it for fractions of a percent, you know, one, two basis points. Um, and you just, um, and that's what in many pension funds do, you just invest in an index tracker. You'll own tobacco companies, you'll own a lot of oil companies, you may own coal companies, um, a whole bunch of things which you may consider uh, unsustainable businesses. So we don't do that. Uh, we do own oil companies, and I'll talk about why. Um, but there's uh, a cost associated with that, and we need to believe that by spending that extra money, we will deliver better risk-adjusted returns. Back in 2011, when we launched, our first contribution was 19 pounds. We're now at nearly 30 billion pounds, and we're going to be, uh, I think, off the top of this chart, covered by that rather nasty black bar at the top, is uh, 47 billion pounds uh, in 2026. So we're, we're growing strongly, um, and that, that scale gives us the opportunity to do a whole bunch of things. So I'm just gonna pull out uh, a few highlights. So 19 was our first contribution. It was pretty plain vanilla investment in those days, but we, we had an aspiration to be sustainable and responsible. Back in 2017, we had our first fully ESG integrated fund, which was a, a global equity fund with climate, uh, what we call our climate aware fund and had climate tilts. And I'll, I'll talk in a bit more detail about that because it's quite an interesting part of the case study. And then we launched our climate change policy, which, which talked about our, tran our transition to net zero target by 2050, if not before. Um, and uh, at the same time, we started going tobacco free. That's when we excluded tobacco companies. And then the next year, we were able to put all our emerging market equities into a climate aware strategy as well. And we started investing in infrastructure and we've got a big emphasis on renewables. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples of that um, a little bit later. So, uh, in terms of implementing our responsible investment objectives, uh, it's across the board. Everything we do involves sustainability. And, and that's really important. There's no point just kind of having 10% you know, of a portfolio in some, some nice, cuddly uh, responsible investment fund or an ethical fund, and then the rest of it just uh, don't care about how we invest it. So whether it's allocating our assets, the managers we choose, engaging with companies, uh, voting our shares, uh, which is active ownership, thinking about the risks, ESG risks in the portfolio, uh, and what we're going to exclude. So we don't exclude a lot, but we do exclude tobacco, controversial weapons, so by that I mean illegal weapons such as cluster munitions. Uh, we exclude coal companies, companies involved in Arctic drilling, companies involved in uh, tar sands and, uh, and oil sands. So basically the really dirty part of the fossil fuel industry. And with the big oil companies, which we exclude some, we exclude Exxon, because they don't, won't engage with us, but we own Shell and BP. And we lobby and we engage with, with, with those companies uh, to push them to have a transition policy to uh, a, a zero carbon economy. So did you have a question? Yes. Um, but it's not just climate. So climate is the most important thing. It's, it's the biggest uh, issue facing the planet um, and therefore our members when they retire. Um, but there's a, there's a whole bunch of other things we, we look at. Um, I'll just pick out a couple. Uh, so human capital. So our members are typically uh, lower pay. So I think median income in this country is about £30,000 a year. The median income of our members is twenty to 24000 And we've got a lot of minimum wage members. So 
but people who work in the King's Arms are probably nest members. For example, they, they will be on minimum wage. Uh, some of you may get jobs in the summer holidays at a pub. Chances are you could be a nest member. Uh, if you know who you are, please put your hand up. Curious? No? So you don't work during the summer. Um, so, uh, so, so one of the things we, we do is we work uh, with companies to try and push uh, what's called the real living wage. So the, um, let's be above um, uh, the, the minimum wage, which is set by the government. So the real living wage is calculated by um, uh, a charitable organization. And it basically says how much you need to earn to live a dignified life above the poverty line. So it, minimum wage is just not enough for most people. And a lot of our members are minimum wage and have to have multiple jobs. Um, that's not a society that we think is, is necessarily the, the one we want to be part of. Um, and, and certainly if people were, are paid better, um, then it's actually good for the economy. People on low wages spend all their marginal income. So you give them a pay rise, they will spend it. They'll save a bit in their pension, hopefully. Um, uh, and therefore, that's good for growth. If you pay high earners more money, they're just going to save it. So actually, there's a lot of benefit for companies to, to stop paying their chief executives quite so much and actually pay um, uh, the, the lower uh, paid in their workforce more money. Um, I'd also pick out natural capital. So that's about biodiversity and uh, things like timber. Um, so we're interested in, in preserving and, and uh, encouraging biodiversity because that goes in hand in hand with uh, climate change and, and uh, you know, it's, it's complementary and it's really important for uh, the environment that we have good biodiversity. So we're just about to start investing in uh, forestry, uh, in, in forest, but, um, and uh, you know, basically reforestation and uh, uh, having more carbon capture uh, by the by the planet. Um, so I said I'd talk about our climate aware strategy. So um, just to see what it does. So uh, we've got I'm trying to think now probably about 14 billion pounds invested in in global equities. Um, and we want that money to have an impact, but we also need to make sure we're well diversified across uh, global equities, across the world, both in sectors and in geographies. So basically, we look at all the companies um, and we do this uh, you know, systematically. Uh, the manager gets all the data from the annual reports um, and basically tries to find companies that are on track uh, to transition to a low carbon economy or zero carbon economy. Um, they look for companies that are supporting the development of renewable energy and similar technologies. And we are un and we're overweighting those companies relative to a sort of global index. Um, and then we are underweighting or excluding companies that are uh, in, on the dirty side, if you like. So, uh, as I already mentioned, coal uh, companies that are um, in, engaged in Arctic, well, trying to engage in Arctic drilling, etc., and companies that are just making no progress in transitioning to a low carbon economy. So, um, as the companies evolve, as they evolve their plans to transition, we'll kind of dial up and down the, the weights of those, um, and, and that's applied across both uh, developed and emerging markets. Um, so, we were one of the first. Uh, pension funds in the UK to adopt this sort of strategy. Now it's becoming uh, relatively mainstream and it, and it has an impact. So uh, we've been involved in shareholder resolutions with Shell, uh, BP, and those companies are starting, starting, albeit reluctantly and not always, uh, sometimes it's two steps forward and one step back, um, to work out their plans to transition to net zero. Um, so this is a systematic strategy, um, and basically we, we try and align everything we do with that strategy. Um, basically, we are long-term holders of these companies, um, so it's really important we use our votes, but we engage with them, um, and, and we encourage the laggards to actually improve the way they behave. There's no, 
if you want to get to a net zero portfolio, you can't just sell all the bad companies. That's not going to have any impact on the world. What we actually need is the worst companies to get better, as well as the good companies continue to get better. So we use our capital, our, our members' money. We, we collaborate with other pension funds and try and really have an impact on the way that the companies behave. Yes, please. Yeah. So we, um, we, do, we do it in a number of ways. Uh, we will have co direct contact. So my uh, equities and responsible investment team will speak to board members um, and, and, and have that conversation. Our, our portfolio managers, our fund, fund managers that we use externally, the likes of UBS Asset Management, they will have those conversations as well. I think what's more powerful is when we collaborate with, with other uh, uh, asset owners and, and asset managers. So there's an organization called Climate Action 100 Plus, which uh, basically gets together and it coordinates action with different uh, companies. So, for example, in the US, there's no point, Nest, going to a US oil company and saying, please change the way that you behave. They, they haven't heard of Nest. But if we can get BlackRock, who are the largest asset manager in the world, to have that conversation, and we're just supportive of that, and that our shares are added to theirs and you know, our other companies' shares, then that has much more influence. So it's, it's really important that we work together with other big asset managers and asset owners, and we, we target the companies um, in a focused and clear way that's going to have an impact. So um, I mean, the best example is through Climate Action 100. So they, they have a clear engagement strategy at the start. They will talk with the companies for uh, probably two or three years. It, it kind of depends how, how much impact they want to have and how quickly. And at the point, uh, either the companies change, and you can see you know, they publish their, their plans for transition to net zero, for example, or to transform the, the company. We see those results, how do they match against the initial objectives? I'd be lying to say, we'll, well, we're, we're never 100% successful. Even with a good engagement, they won't go as far as we necessarily want, but they will make progress. There are companies that won't engage or do anything, Exxon being a great example. And at that point, we say, right, enough is enough, and we will exit. So there has to be an exit route. Having said that, I mean, Exxon, there was a shareholder resolution to change the composition of the board and get two direct. I mean, you looked at the Exxon board, they knew nothing about climate change. Right? It was, I mean, you know, the US, some of the US is in denial, but it's even happening. But um, uh, so, so we actually managed, before we exited, to get two board members uh, on, uh, or shareholders collaborated to, to, get, to get two board members on who might have a view, uh, su sufficient knowledge to think about changing the company. We still, they're still not changing, so it's too early to go back in. But, but again, that's something we will track. Not only the companies we do own, but the companies we don't own. Yeah. I'm curious about the degree of your activism. Uh, how often do you pursue the mission of the networks and maybe being off of the members who are going to be doing the company? Sorry, I don't know. How often do you pursue the mission of the networks? So it's, uh, what should I say? We, we, we can't cover the whole uh, uh, universe. So, so we, we have to really focus. So I, I showed you my pro our priorities earlier. So we try and pick probably one or two companies on each of those subjects every year. So um, this year, for example, on the living wage, uh, we targeted Sainsbury's. Um, and we had um, a meeting with the chairman, um, and uh, that was 
again, and, and we also uh, made some noise in the press. So a lot of, so the, the US activists, particularly activist hedge funds, who make a big splash. And then there's the big traditional asset managers who try and do everything behind the scenes. We don't think either of those is, is necessarily the right strategy. You, you start behind the scenes, but you, you've got to be prepared to accelerate it and make the big splash. Otherwise, companies will just, they'll drag it out. I mean, to your point, you know, they will drag out the engagement as long as you want. Now, we, we target focus, as I said, on a few companies. We rely on other asset owners to do the same with other companies. We are not activist in the sense that we want to, we're looking to sell every, you know, either make an impact or sell every company. But we are just trying to get enough momentum across the investment universe that uh, companies can sit up and take notice. So one of the things that I, I think is when you have a success as a, as a group of asset owners or and asset managers, when you go on to the next one, that company can see the success you've already had and will take you much more seriously. So it's definitely improving shareholder, but you get more success in shareholder resolutions. Just voting against board members, it, it, it's not, I mean, we do it, we do it a lot, but it, it, it's not that impactful. Having successful shareholder resolutions is so much better, but so much harder. Um, so, and just, there's some metrics here around our, our Climate Aware Fund. Um, probably a bit hard to read. So it, we, we're just trying to track the um, progress towards a one and a half degree scenario. So the dotted line here um, it is our target um, for transitioning to net zero. So we are ahead of target already. Uh, we've reduced uh, carbon intensity. So I think the scope one by 65%. Uh, we're overweight renewable energy we're 50% below on fossil fuel reserves. Um, I think we'll probably, these slides will be shared if you, uh, uh, yeah, the slides will be shared. So we don't need to take uh, too many pictures. Um, so, you know, we're, we're making real progress in terms of reducing our carbon intensity. But we need, as I already said, we need the companies to move with us. It's no good just selling um, the bad companies. We do, we sell the worst but uh, we want to change uh, the behavior of as many as possible. Uh, right, so this is our climate change policy, um, which we announced in July 2020. I won't go into too much detail here, because I've kind of already touched on it, but basically we are trying to align our portfolio with a one and a half degree world. Having said that, I think one and a half degrees is probably impossible. Um, at this point, uh, as, as depressing as that is. So to some extent, we've also got to think about how do we protect our members' portfolios against the two-degree world or the two-and-a-half-degree world or, heaven forbid, the three-degree world. So um, as much as we, we hope the world will point in the direction of one-and-a-half degrees, it's not too late, but it's too late if uh, China, India, uh, the US kind of don't get all behind this. And, and we can all make a judgment as to how likely we think that is. So uh, let's talk about more positive things. So we're helping finance the transition to net zero by investing heavily in renewables. So the top one, Hornsey One, that's the world's largest wind farm. At Nest, we own uh, nearly 7% of that. Um, we are financing the construction of uh, new wind and solar farms. So Rodine, their second one down, that's a, 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 a wind farm being constructed in southern Sweden. Um, we are involved in the technologies uh, supporting renewables and distribution of renewable energy as well. Um, and uh, this portfolio is going to be um, well, it's, it's already the largest renewables portfolio, I think, for a, certainly for a UK defined contribution fund, uh, probably uh, the largest amongst um, any pension fund in the UK um, already. 
So this is vital. Our next challenge is how do we finance renewable energy in emerging markets? So one of the issues around um, these fixed assets is governments can change the rules and they can seize the assets. So there was a, a classic example in Spain a few years ago where uh, people be, built uh, wind and solar farms. Um, they had a fixed price agreement with the government and then the government decided unilaterally to change the price. That changed the economics of those investments um, immediately. Um, and Spain is a developed market. Um, so, you know, what, what happens when you go into an emerging market where there's probably less governance, uh, less rule of, uh, well, the, the rules are more likely to change adversely. So that's something we're thinking about. How can we protect those investments? But there's no doubt that emerging markets need more renewable energy. Um, you know, that, that is definitely the next big challenge. Um, I've, I've talked a little bit about this already. So workforce, um, improving human capital, improving diversity um, amongst uh, senior management and boards, um, are all important to improving the way that companies behave and, and their role in the economy. So this is about, I mean, ultimately we call it sustainable capitalism. Uh, it's not a term we, we thought of, uh, it's just one we borrowed. Um, but basically, I mean, the, the classic story is uh, um, back at when Henry T. Ford was, was building cars, right? Uh, you know, built, he devised a production line, and then he gave all his workers a pay rise so that they could afford to buy Ford cars. And, and um, you know, if you pay people properly, you have a better mo motivated workforce and they can be more active economic participants. So we, we think we've unfortunately gone in the other direction. Inequality in, in the UK and the US in particular have increased massively. That is not a sustainable way to run an economy. And as a result, you get the rise of populism. Uh, I don't want to get too political, but you know, the likes of Trump being elected was a, was a symptom of um, that rising inequality. So we think there's better ways to run the economy um, and by controlling executive pay, paying your workers better, um, having more diverse boards, that leads to a much better uh, way, way to run business. Um, and one of the reasons we care about this is because it impacts directly our members. So they are more likely to be the lower paid in the workforce. So if they get a pay rise, they, they're paid a real living wage, that's good for our members, both because they're paid more, it means they can save more for their pension as well, which means they'll have a better outcome um, in later life. So, um, you know, we, we don't choose these topics randomly. Climate change is important to our members. Uh, workforce, proper use of uh, reward of human capital is also important to our members. We can't do everything. There are some things which are, you know, just... Uh, beyond the, the ability for us to afford to do things. So we just target very carefully what we do want to do. Um, I've talked a little bit about natural capital already. So um, investing in timber, sustainable agriculture, for example. Um, impact investing is a, uh, a, a trend of the moment that, that people are starting to think about. Um, typically, it's been, involved, it's been associated with basically not good returns, so philanthropic investment. Um, you basically put money in because it has a good impact, not expecting a return. We can't do that. We need to build, get a return for our members. And so when we think about impact, we think, how can we have a positive in impact on society and still get a return for our members? Um, and I've given you examples of that, you know, the, the way we engage with companies, uh, investing in renewable energy, um, so we, we look at the impact of all our investments. They're not all positive, but net, net, we hope to have a, uh, an overall uh, positive impact on society. And finally, it's, we do this not only because it's good for our members' pots, but because uh, their financial returns, but also they care about it. 
that uh, when we talk to our members, we don't talk to all 11 million, I hasten to add, we, but we, we do surveys, we get you know, statistically uh, uh, relevant uh, samples, and for our members, sustainable investing is really important. So pretty well half say it matters a lot. Um, another quarter say, well, actually, it matters, but don't sacrifice returns. Um, I don't believe we need to sacrifice returns in order to do that. And, and a small percentage, um, either, well, about a quarter, either don't know or don't care. Um, so it is important to our members, um, and, and that's why uh, and another reason supporting why we should invest sustainably. So when it comes to it, I talked at the start about giving better risk-adjusted returns. So here's the evidence. Um, so this is the, the one sort of technical chart I'm using. Uh, so up, up the y-axis is the returns, five-year returns of our fund uh, and, and other funds, and the x-axis is volatility. So it's a measure of risk, not the only measure of risk. The red dot, identify that. I'm going to point it out here in case anyone's watching the camera. That's our competition. Uh, basically, the, the biggest pension providers in the UK that compete with us. And the orange dot is where we are. So we've got better returns in the average for our competitors, and we're doing it at lower risk. And the lower risk is, is a really important bit, I think. People hate losing money. They hate seeing volatility in their pension fund. Um, so we reduce volatility. And by investing in things like renewable energy, uh, infrastructure, which have quite sustainable, you know, uh, um, low volatility returns, um, we can actually improve the risk-adjusted returns for our members. So it's not just we're, we're nice people, we're doing this to be nice, it's actually because we think this is going to deliver better outcomes in the long term for our members. So I've talked for pretty well 45 minutes. I didn't actually mean to talk that long, but I did answer some questions along the way. So, uh, if you'd like to ask any questions, any more questions? So I'm sure uh, we have questions. So yes. I think what, what we'll do is, let me just start by asking a question. It's kind of a slightly longer question. But also, when you ask your questions, maybe you could use the mic. So we'll pass the mic around. And Philip will pass the mic around. So my, my, kind of, it has, my question has two parts to it. We, we talked about sustainable investing as if it's different from investing in general. So we are yeah. differentiating. So let's say there's something called sustainable investing. Now, if sustainable investing, and the question, the part A is, is sustainable investing giving better risk-adjusted returns? Right? And assuming that you're focusing on better risk-adjusted returns. The first question, is it, does it provide you with better returns after adjusting for risk? And if the answer is yes, then why isn't everybody doing it, right? And if the answer is no, which means it's really not doing that, then how do you justify that under your fiduciary duty? And so you could maybe talk a little bit about fiduciary duty yeah. as well. Yeah. So the, fortunately, the answer is yes. Uh, um, and I demonstrated the data up there. Yeah. Um, of course, it depends how you do it. And that, that's true of any investment, right? Unsustainable investing Will, will sometimes deliver better returns and sometimes won't. So you've got to do, whatever investing you do, you've got to do it well. Um, that's, that's the first thing. And, and your fiduciary duty is basically, we have to invest in the best interest of our members. Now that, that's not a, necessarily a well-defined concept. So if you, if you go to the US, where there's a big, anti-ESG movement, particularly in the, in the, the middle southern states, we got the likes of Texas, etc. Um, they think ESG investing is against their fiduciary duty. That, that would be the, the prior. So I, I think it's, um, but we believe, for the reasons kind of I mentioned, you know, climate change is a reality, right? How do we mitigate the impact of climate change? So we're doing things which are positive by you know, financing uh, construction renewables. Um, and we're also 
making sure we avoid the areas we think are most likely to have stranded assets, for example, yeah. um, coal, as an example. So we, we believe that's our judgment and it aligns with our fiduciary duty. The thing about investment is why doesn't everyone do it? Well, people have different opinions. People take different judgments, right? And, and, and that's what makes a market. If everyone thought the same, if everyone was investing in renewable energy and, and divesting coal, coal assets would get really cheap and renewable assets would get really expensive. And so by investing in renewables, we then wouldn't be able to make a return. And actually, you know, we, you might be able to buy a coal company and make all your money back in one year, and it's unlikely to be stranded in one year. So that is not an impossible scenario. You've seen tendencies to, 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 to get bubbles in, in certain elements of the renewable energy market. So we have to keep an eye on valuations as well. Yeah. I think there's this whole thing around investor beliefs. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, it comes up because, you know, why is Exxon Mobil just doubling up on fossil fuels? And that depends on your belief. But anyway, uh, so yeah, let's move the mic around. There's a question. So please also introduce yourself and then we start with the question. Hello, uh, my name is William Wallach. I'm a master's student here doing a master's in water science and policy, but my background's in finance, actually from Texas. So these, one of these places where ESG is quite controversial, um, but now doing climate finance work. You mentioned that impact investing is not for your clientele because they demand risk adjusted market returns. Has your fund considered having an impact fund that has 90% of the assets being traditional equity assets that are ESG focused and then having five, to 10% of the funding non-revenue generating assets. I specifically asked this question in reference to like climate adaptation. Most of the climate that climate work that you were focused on was on mitigation and not as much on adaptation. The primary reason for that likely is because adaptation doesn't have the same kind of returns as mitigation. And so wondering if you could also target climate adaptation with possibly having the impact fund that had five to 10% 10, 10 of the assets be non-revenue generating and then have the remaining 90% of assets be climate sensitive, ESG sensitive, and then be normal, like risk, generate normal risk adjusted returns? So we can't. So the fiduciary duty in, in the UK means we cannot invest in things which don't generate a return. Now, having said that, not all returns need to be equal. So, you know, the, when, whenever you choose an investment, there is an element of judgment. So we may say, right, we'll invest in this lower returning asset, which we know has a positive impact, but our just our estimate of the risk associated with that is also lower, and therefore on a risk adjusted basis, it's fine. It fits into the portfolio because it's complementary and diversifying. So we can't go for zero return, but we not everything has to be trying to shoot the lights out. And so that is definitely the direction we are moving. So we are we've got a uh, a set of investment beliefs, which we're just revising at the moment. And our current, our new investment belief, or one of the new investment beliefs, actually says we will think about the impact of our investments in our portfolio, and we will we will target having a net positive impact. So we're going somewhere along that that spectrum, but we we can't go as be as radical. Yeah, so I mean, what we could do, potentially, what, well, one thing we definitely can do is offer a fund, a separate fund choice, which really targets impact and, and, and states clearly that it's likely to be a lower return. The reason we don't do that is 99% of our members make no fund choice at all. They're in the default position, which is fine because it's a great portfolio and it's got you know, all the elements I, I talked about. It'd be uneconomic for that one. And the one percent that do make choices, they're in the ethical fund or the Sharia fund or the higher risk fund, etc. So we don't have the scale at this point uh, because there's a cost associated with that uh, to offer that in, in very high impact fund. That may come down the track, you know, at, at some point. At the same time, 
we are moving into areas. So one of the areas we're moving into is um, built to rent housing in the UK. There's a massive housing shortage in the UK, particularly in the rental space. Uh, as part of those built to rent programs, there will be um, either social housing or affordable housing elements. So, so there's definitely, you know, we, we are tilting in the direction that you implied, I guess. We'll see how far you can get. I, I, I wanted to just add to that. Just, just run this thought experiment. There's grandpa sitting on this side, investing in Mark's fund, right? And grandpa is wanting the retirement to be taken care of, right? So the Mark has to invest so that the retirement is taken care of. Now, if Mark goes and invests in something that's returning less than the market, in a way, it's taking grandpa's money and subsidizing something X. So grandpa is subsidizing X, right? And that kind of, in some ways, runs against fiduciary duty at a very high level. Now, I'm just adding to Mark's point about it is possible that you create a separate fund where you say, okay, grandpa, if you really want to invest in something that's then you're willing to lose your returns, please invest in it directly, that's possible. And that, that, that's very important. All right, yeah. please introduce yourself. Um, hi, I'm Mungo Wilson. So, uh, I'm an associate professor at the business school here. Thank you very much. Dad. I wanted to know if you've ever considered or actually do invest in carbon credits. Yes. Uh, so this is a uh, very topical because because we're looking to invest in timber. We're wondering what to do with our timber and whether to sell the carbon credits. So we're not looking at carbon credits as an asset class to trade in the sense of we'll buy them in the market, but we are thinking of generating carbon credits. And then, well, what do we do with those? So we're quite keen that we should sell them to companies that are using them as part of their transition strategy and not using them to avoid a transition strategy. That's quite a hard one. And, and will they pay the same price? You know, that, that's quite interesting. But, but carbon is not priced correctly in the world at the moment, but it's getting better in parts. And I'm not an expert in this space, so you, you guys probably a lot more than me about it, but but I definitely think they have a role. Carbon credits definitely have a role to play. What we're really keen to avoid is that companies. I went I went to a lecture recently, and 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 the, the professor said, "Forget net zero. It's just going to be zero, absolute zero. The idea that we're going to do a lot of offsetting, which is going to take the world to net zero." fantasy so there's probably a tail but but you know the use of land needs to be used to, to grow crops as well as to grow forests for carbon capture for example so um there, there is a real limit to, to the role they play but they will play an important role um, that's probably the limit of my knowledge so if you ask a follow-up <laughs> i might pass you somewhere else yeah i mean I mean, carbon markets, or carbon credits have their issues, and one of the issues is what's the additionality of these? Are they really additional to what we would have done otherwise? And there's a lot of controversy yeah. around that as well. Yeah, it, it's not properly regulated. So there is a, one of my team who actually wrote her master's dissertation on, on offsetting. So, um, you know, poor regulation, double selling of credits, there's probably a whole bunch of other things. Um, so, so this needs to be a market which is properly regulated and, and we want to plant new forests, not just buy existing ones. That's the thing. But there are other issues. Uh, so there are more questions. I know there was a question here. And uh, the cell phones here yeah, have the image right here. Oh, yeah. So please go ahead and uh, state your name and ask your question. Um, hi, I'm Ming Ran and uh, I'm the first PFL student and my research proposal is related to climate investment and green growth. And um, I have a couple of questions. The first one is about ESG rating system. Currently, some literature showed that, showed that um, the divergence of the ESG rating and it received tons of criticism 
because we have different objectives. So the um, aggregated overall score may didn't reflect the um, much uh, information. So what's your opinion about this? This is my first question about DST rating. And I'll answer about, about one first. Okay. When you get to my age, you're forgetting the first question once you get the second question. So uh, just for people's information, so MSCI, Sustained Analytics, and S&P are, are, are three of the major ESG rating providers. If you look at the correlation between them on different companies, it's about zero, I think. Um, and, that, and that's a real problem in terms of uh, you know, providing credibility to, to these ratings. If you look at the underlying components, there's much more correlation. It's the way they put those components together. Um, so we, we don't use those ratings. We do use some of the components that, that build up those ratings. But yeah, this is, if you think about the credibility of ESG investing, it's these sort of things that really undermine it. By the way, there's going to be a talk by Florian Berg, who has worked on this a lot. So we look up, look up for his talk. Yeah. And um, my second question is a new opinion about ESG investing. It's highly similar to uh, fundamental investing because we focus on firms' fundamentals and we use the, uh, different metrics to uh, see a firm from different aspects. So um, I was wondering how, because uh, ESG focuses on longer time return. So how can we like cultivate um, patience and humility in these fund managers to help them to focus on fundamentals, not to short-term return? And what's the focal point? Uh, that's a great question. So you know, I worked for a hedge fund at one point. We, all we were concerned about is a day's return, you know, each, each day. It, it's crazy, right? Um, so I, I think you kind of raised a really good point. So e ESG integration is just part of fundamental investing. These are just generally longer term, and not always longer term, but generally longer term factors when assessing a company's investability. Um, so it's people like us who can promote that long-term thinking because we are long-term investors. So whenever I, we meet our asset managers, and we meet them typically quarterly, we don't talk about performance. Right? So, so we talk about what are the opportunities you're seeing, how are you managing the risk of the portfolio. You know, the, the performance is the outcome, and, and we care about the long-term outcome, so we don't care about the short term. Providing they are investing the way we chose, you know, the way they explained it before we appointed them, and they carry on investing in that style, and they keep thinking about all sorts of risks, including ESG risks, then that's what we want. And I can, I'm pleased to say all our managers are outperforming since we appointed them. So, but there is some benefit to long-term investing, and we're, we're starting to realize that long-term. But, but for every client like us, there's probably a few who all they care about is the short term. So I can't change the world like that, but we can do our, we can do our bit. But it, it's, a, it's an endemic problem, and the whole quarterly reporting in the US in particular, you know, it just drives short-term performance, short-term investing. All right, okay, uh, let me just, uh, you have more questions? Okay, but let me just interrupt you because I have to be fair to online people as well. So let me ask a question. Not too fair, they didn't turn up. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so the question was, I think a couple of questions. Uh, one was, um, you show a low carbon equity fund. Yeah. Uh, but uh, at least we didn't, at least the question says that they didn't see a low carbon debt fund. <laughs> Is that something that you have thought about? Yes. And, and what are yeah. your perspectives on getting a low carbon debt fund into your portfolio? So, so actually, so what I should have said is, basically all our asset classes are um, working towards net zero. Mm -hmm. So they will all be underweight carbon. Mm -hmm. It's just we, we did 
the equity fund first. So we've made more progress on that. But, but our corporate bond funds are integrating ESG. The, the only fund we haven't really made any progress on is our commodities fund. Um, but the reason we had commodities in there is because we had this systematic underweight in carbon, we wanted our commodities manager to hedge for short-term risk. Commodities investors are always traders. They're, they're really short-term. So, and that's fine because that's kind of what we wanted them to do. And therefore, when commodity prices went up really strongly in the last year, when thinking when Russia invaded Ukraine, but even before that, um, we were our commodities fund did fantastically well. So it offset some of the declines elsewhere as global equity markets report. But long term, we also want our commodities. For, I mean, think about the future commodities: copper, uh, you know, basically anything that conducts electricity is going to be in really strong demand. Uh, so we want those exposure to those commodities and we want to reduce our exposure to oil but not all not immediately because we keep going to keep burning oil for many years but on a hopefully declining trend so i'll come to you after one more question okay so you, you get the last question um, um and, the, and the question is uh, connecting to what the couple of questions that were asked during your presentation and that that has to do with engagement and divestment so why, and the question is, why divest at all when you can continue to engage and keep on making changes? And, and, and what is divestment getting in terms of, again, connecting to Christoph's question around the, the, the change in the outcome that you want, which is hopefully in this case is lower carbon. Yeah. And I mean, it, it's something we've grappled with, uh, I mean, Exxon would be would be a great example of this. So we did eventually divest Exxon because they refused to engage with us. And we want to reduce we want to reduce our carbon exposure gradually. We want that to be driven primarily by companies reducing their carbon exposure. So di you can't divest your way to net zero. Is, is the point. Should we so? so but if Exxon won't listen to us, maybe we can deploy our capital better elsewhere. So we, if, if BP will listen to us and we give them more capital, then we've got more sway with BP than we have with Exxon. So, but it's a, it's a fine balance. You know, there, there's, this is kind of why when Ben asked me to come and talk, I, I, was, I was happy to do it because in, in the real world, you know, you have to make these quite difficult judgments and I'm not saying we get them all right, but 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 you work out what the trade-offs are and then think. Yeah, yeah. All right. I'm actually also watching time. We're kind of over time, but I promised you one last question. So please and, go ahead. And I'm going for drinks. So if you want to come to drink and ask yes, more questions, all, then we can chat. But Thank you so much. Why don't you ask the last question and then we'll talk over drinks? Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. And my last question is, um, what's the advantage and disadvantage to incorporate ESG into the investing process in the private market compared to the public market? Um, so I think in the private markets, you actually have more leverage and, and can have a bigger impact because, you know, so, so for example, we, we lend money to, to companies in the US and, and Europe um, privately. So often they will have to change the terms of their loans. We have a primary lender, so they come to us and say, right, we want to change the terms of the loan. Say we want to pay back a bit more slowly because we've got this great investment project um, and we want to invest the cash in that rather than pay your um, capital re principal repayment. And we can say, that's fine, but the way we're tracking your sustainability, we think you need to work harder. <laughs> And they'll tell us, right, so we'll have that conversation and they can tell us how they're going to transition or, you know, or be a more sustainable company and we'll give them extra time out to repay their loan. You can't do that in the public markets. In, in the high yield market, we'd like, we've got a fraction of a, of a percent of an issue. So we, you never have that conversation. Similarly, in private equity, you're prime, you know, you are the primary funder of that company. Now, that all sounds fantastic, doesn't it? 
The problem is the private markets are so far behind on ESG and thinking about ESG, the managers, you know, a lot of them are US managers, they just don't, you know, this is only just coming onto their radar screen. But it's moving in the right direction and, and we can have the conversations with the managers as well as with, with the companies. So, so I, I think private markets is just a great opportunity event. There's all the renewables and the infrastructure and stuff, which is just positive impact generally. But um, yeah, there's a, there's a way to go for, for the private equity space as well. All right. Well, thank you everybody for coming for the talk and thank you, Mark, for no, this great pleasure. conversation. Yeah. Thank you for your great questions. Thank you. And so we're going to wrap up here now. And as I had said, there is a reception at the cafe. Oh, it's right around the corner. Okay, yeah. around the corner. Okay. So please do join us. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And again, again let's uh, thank Mark again. Thank you.